Good afternoon. Um, I, I want to say a few words about one of uh, several campaign developments of the last day. Uh, yesterday, Donald Trump was asked a question about post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, and other challenges facing many of our troops. And part of his response was that post-traumatic stress happens to troops who, quote, can't handle it. He said, if you're strong, you can handle it. Many people are now standing up and speaking out against Trump because post-traumatic stress is not something that strong people can handle and weak people can't. Some of the strongest men and women any of us will ever meet have experienced post-traumatic stress. Donald Trump's comments are not just ignorant, they're harmful because they give voice to the stigma that has led generations of veterans to hide their struggles instead of getting life-saving help. That stigma still exists, and lots of people who need help aren't getting it. You know what doesn't help with that? When a man asking to be our next commander-in-chief stands up and says post-traumatic stress isn't a problem if you're strong. Vice President Joe Biden spoke about this in an interview earlier today, and he said that every morning he gets an update from the Pentagon on how many troops were injured or killed around the world overnight. We learned earlier today that an American service member was killed by an IED in Afghanistan. Every one of our troops matter. Their wounds can be visible and invisible. Most of us know that, but apparently Donald doesn't. Our troops deserve a commander-in-chief who understands and respects the sacrifices they make. Whether they're living with post-traumatic stress or their POWs or they don't make it home and they leave a grieving family behind. And every American dealing with mental health challenges deserves compassion, whether they've ever served in uniform or not. So I hope the voters are hearing Donald Trump loudly and clearly. And I want to thank our service members, our veterans, and all of our military families for their service and sacrifice. A woman named Jennifer Grackey, who's here with us, heard what Donald Trump said yesterday, and she contacted my campaign on our website to express her concern. She lost her husband to post-traumatic stress after he had served honorably and bravely. And she wanted to be sure that I and everyone else understand the strength it takes to serve and the strength it takes often to deal with the problems and consequences of that service. Jennifer reached out to us and said that she lives in Harrisburg and we invited her to be here with us and I'm very grateful uh, that she is. So with that, I'll be happy to take some of your questions. burden using legal methods and wouldn't anyone else have done the same thing well first of all let's start with the fact that he lost a billion dollars this is a man who spends hours every day proclaiming his great business skills and success he lost a billion dollars and as I've said repeatedly that's hard to do when you're running casinos but it demonstrates I think unequivocally that he was a failure at business and he wrecked businesses and by wrecking his businesses he wrecked the lives of his workers he stiffed contractors uh, and he generally disregarded uh, the well-being of the communities uh, in which uh, he operated I have said repeatedly we've got to close all the loopholes that give uh, special tax breaks to the wealthy and corporations and I will certainly do that but there are some very successful business people in America I was in Omaha 
some weeks back, and Warren Buffett said, I'll meet him anywhere, anytime. I'll bring my tax returns, let him bring his. But he's unable to put out his tax returns because there's more in there that demonstrate that he did business in a way that left wreckage behind him and that he lost a billion dollars which gave him benefits that should not be available to him. Uh, so I'm very clear in my assessment that someone who is claiming to run for president based on his business uh, success should be judged by that business. And I think what we're finding out is deeply troubling. I met a man today at the uh, rally who said he's a longtime Republican. And I said, so why are you here? And he said, well, I'm here because I'm a longtime Republican who is undecided, and I want to hear what Hillary Clinton has to say. What is your strategy to get the undecideds to go with your campaign? Well, I'm glad he was here, and I'm glad that uh, you had a chance uh, to talk with him because we're finding more and more Republicans who are uh, both coming to events and endorsing me, making it clear, as 50 national security experts did, that they cannot uh, vote for Donald Trump. They view him as uh, unqualified and temperamentally unfit to be president and commander-in-chief. So we're working as hard as we can during these next 35 years, 35 years, 35 days, uh, to uh, reach as many undecided voters as possible, including the gentleman that came here today. And when I work the rope line, um, I have people all the time say, you know, I, I'm making up my mind. I, I, after I saw the debate, I want to support you. Um, I want some more information. I'm feeling very good that now that Americans are really tuning in and understanding the consequences of this election, uh, we're going to attract more undecided and, yes, even uh, Republicans and certainly independents uh, to our campaign. Hey, Ken. I'm very um, confident and excited about Tim Kaine uh, in the debate tonight uh, because he understands what's at stake in the election. He knows what our policies are, as uh, you've heard me say, Ken, we actually put a book out together to talk about what we want to do to move our country forward. So he is ready to go toe-to-toe um, -to -toe with uh, Mike Pence on all the issues that matter to Americans. He's ready to take uh, that fight to uh, the Trump-Pence ticket. Um, he has an exemplary record uh, as a mayor, as governor, as senator to talk about uh, solving problems, meeting challenges head on. I think America is going to uh, be very impressed and uh, really feel positive about uh, Tim Kaine as our next vice president. I'm sorry, what? What about Governor Pence's task at hand? Well, I'm not going to uh, really talk about Governor Pence's task. I think he has a huge burden defending both his own record and the record of Donald Trump, and we'll see how well he can do that. Hi, Secretary. Hi. Um, Julian Assange this morning said he plans to release documents in the next 35 <clears throat> days that could um, affect the U.S. election. Are you worried that there's anything that could come out that would upend the race? And related to that, there's a report going around that you joked once about Assange, can't we just drone the guy? Did you ever joke about droning Assange? Well, I, I, I don't know anything about what he's talking about, and uh, I don't recall any joke. Um, it would have been a joke if it uh, had been said, but I don't recall that. And second part of the question, former President Bill Clinton raised some eyebrows, uh, thank you, yesterday when he said that the Affordable Care Act is, quote, the craziest thing in the world. He tried to clarify today. Do you wish he had used different words? Can you clarify what he meant? And do you worry it could undercut your argument that you want to build on and expand the Affordable Care Act? No, I, I don't. Let, let me, uh, uh, Tim and I have been emailing back and forth um, because I know how intense it is to prepare uh, for a debate. And uh, I'm really proud of how seriously he's taken that preparation. So we're going to keep emailing. I don't want to 
interrupt his rhythm uh, by calling. I'll talk to him after it's over. Uh, he sent me a great assessment of my uh, performance uh, in the first debate, which I found right on the mark and very uh, helpful. Now, with respect to the Affordable Care Act, I've been saying we've got to fix what's broken and keep what works. And that's exactly what we're going to do. I am committed to making sure that people retain coverage that they can afford. And that is going to require taking on uh, premium cost and deductible cost and prescription drug cost. And, you know, it, it is challenging uh, to try to make sure that this important step toward providing insurance for every American uh, is fixed and not repealed, which is the Republican position. So it's a little challenging uh, when you've got somebody like Donald Trump talking about doing away with the Affordable Care Act, turning in our health insurance system back over to insurance companies, which would not just, and I want to stress this because I'm not sure every one of your readers or viewers really understands. What that means is not just that the 20, 21 million people on the exchanges would lose their coverage. If you repeal the Affordable Care Act, that means every American who is insured through your employer will all of a sudden go back to the days when insurance companies could deny you health care because of pre-existing conditions, where you would have lifetime limits, where young people would not be able to afford coverage, whereas now they can stay on their parents' policies until the age of 26. All that and more is part of the Affordable Care Act. So this is a really big deal because it affects a you know, about 195 to 200 million Americans. And so people need to really pay attention when Trump says he's going to get rid of it and turn it back to the insurance companies. And then one of the strangest things he has said, and there's a long litany of those, but one of them is how he wants to let insurance companies sell across state lines. In fact, he told an interview about a year ago, hey, I don't care if uh, China sells us our insurance policies. I mean, imagine getting approval for your drug by calling Beijing. I mean, there's just so much that he doesn't either understand or care about. So yeah, we're going we're gonna to tackle it. We're going to fix it. And uh, it won't be easy, but it's a heck of a lot better than starting from scratch, uh, which is what, uh, unfortunately, the Republicans want us to do. I, th I think he made it clear what he was saying. Hi. Preparing for uh, a debate. And can you right. tell us a little bit about what you learned from your first debate with Donald Trump and how you'll prepare for the next one? Well, I learned that preparation is important, uh, which is something that I've known because I've done a lot of uh, debates going back uh, to my Senate years. Um, and I, I learned, too, that uh, it's important to uh, keep in mind what your objectives are and what you're trying to uh, demonstrate to the uh, tens of millions of people who are watching. This will be different because this is a town hall format, and so it takes a different kind of approach. You're dealing with uh, people who I think are undecided voters who will be selected by um, the networks uh, to be there. And so it's important that you listen to their questions and uh, try your best to answer them. So I'm going to you know, do everything I can to get prepared and be ready on Sunday night. All right, folks, thanks very much. Okay, thank you all.